Debunking the Eco-Justice Climate Kids Court Case, a story in several parts. Part 1. Mother et al. versus the Crown. Our atmosphere is being poisoned. This poison is seeping into our brains. It is killing us. The poison is not carbon dioxide. It is fear. It is irresponsible to pretend that carbon dioxide is a poison that is killing us, shoving this fearful idea down the throats of trusting children who are a captive audience is a form of child abuse. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. I just read a short excerpt of an article from the Toronto Star, kind of a rare article to find in the Toronto Star, but it is very disturbing to read this article and see how deeply embedded fear of climate change is in our children. And so that's one of the things I want to address in this critique of the Gen Climate Action Eco-Justice lawsuit of seven young people against the Ontario government. So it's going to be a bit of a long presentation, but I want to give you the full details as I find them. And I'm also going to be critical of CBC's reporting of this trial. So um, let's have a look at the things that I found and see what you think about them. So the woman who wrote this um, had been talking with a class of students and she found that this conversation haunted her. Why are we instilling young people with fear when we should be imbuing them with confidence? These kids need to wake up every day thinking anything is possible, not we're all doomed. So let's look at part one, CBC reporting and the public interest. So EcoJustice had a rally for climate prior to the actual court case starting. And EcoJustice had this uh, case in court uh, some time ago and it was thrown out. So they made an appeal to a higher court trying to get approval to proceed with the uh, case. And they described them, their um, action as schooling politicians on climate. So these are the seven young people and one of their lawyers. And as you see, here's the EcoJustice um, logo with whales, mom and child the scales of justice and, wow, wind turbines, who would have thought that? And EcoJustice was formerly Sierra Legal Defense Fund. Um, you may find that of interest when I later talk about foreign funders. So here's the CBC headline, Seven Young People Sued Ontario Over Its Climate Policy. This week they made their case. Seven young people who brought a landmark lawsuit against the Ontario government alleging its climate plan fails to protect them and future generations were heard in Ontario Superior Court in Toronto. This is the first time a climate lawsuit aimed at changing government policy has had a full hearing in court. So that is pretty important information right there. Now, the plaintiffs, represented by environmental law charity EcoJustice, brought the suit in 2019 after the Progressive Conservative government of Premier Doug Ford replaced the former Liberal government's climate plan. It ended the province's cap and trade program and brought in a new, weaker emissions target. So I added bold there. But isn't it odd that CBC has no further questions? How did these seven young people all come together? And how did they manage to get eco-justice to represent them? And why would they care about the province's cap and trade program? Doesn't that seem a bit odd to you? Seems very odd to me. So here we have Gen Climate Action. Why you're never too young, too old, or too in between to join the climate movement. And this is from the eco-justice website. 
And who do we have here in the picture? We have Kathy Orlando and her daughter, Sophia Mathur. And um, there they are. She's just a child. But now she's a teen. So Sophia is age 15 and she was the first student in Canada to start a school strike for climate as part of the Fridays for Future movement, inspired by the work of Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. Well, well, well. How about that? That does take initiative and it does take courage. And perhaps it also takes the fact that your mom is on the board with Greta of the We Don't Have Time Foundation. So here we have Kathy Orlando. That's Kathy right there. Of course, we know this fellow is Al Gore. Here's Sophia as a younger child. And I guess that's probably dad. Um, so Kathy and Greta are on the We Don't Have Time Foundation Board of Directors. And We Don't Have Time is a group of carbon kings who are pushing carbon trading uh, and uh, all kinds of climate matters worldwide. They're also associated with a large ad agency and social media um, group. So uh, we find here also in the Swedish version of this IPO, IPO means initial public offering. So they're actually selling shares in this project. So we find Kathy there in Sweden and we also in Swedish and we also find Greta. So it's a real thing. Now I don't know if she's still on the board, but um, Sophia's connection to Greta is not simply one of inspiration. So is Greta a heroic self-made phenomenon or are you believing in absurdity? Well, I recommend people read um, the book or blog by left-wing journalist Corey Morningstar because it will give you quite a different view of what's gone on. Um, this is part of Corey's blog. The same materials in both. If you want to support her, I would buy the book, but you can read it for free online. It's in several parts. And you could also watch our video that we made talking about Greta Thunberg's secret to success, carbon offsets, corporations, and school climate strike. So her mom is part of, or actually the executive director of Citizens Climate Lobby. Now they pushed for the carbon tax and dividend program in Canada, and they won. See, this is all about it. So it, they call it climate income. Now, doesn't that sound good? Carbon fee and dividend. So Canadians, those of you who qualify are getting climate income now. Wow, how about that? And why? Well, why climate income? As long as fossil fuels remain artificially cheap and profitable, their use will rise. Correcting this market failure requires their price to account for their true social costs. So they intentionally up the price of fossil fuels, which is pushing people into heat or eat poverty. And uh, what will a national carbon price do? With full revenue return and border adjustments, it will do four things. Internalize the social cost of carbon-based fuels, rapidly achieve large emission reductions, and stimulate the economy, and recruit global participation. Well, I would say based on the evidence, none of those things have happened. And since CO2 is not the control knob that can fine tune climate, it's very unlikely that there'll be any reduction in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And the point that we've made many times is that politicians can't stop climate change, but citizens' climate lobby obviously feels they can. And CCL Canada, Citizens Climate Lobby, here's a little bit about them. They have logged well over 1,400 meetings with parliamentarians and generated well over 3,500 letters to editors, opinion pieces, editorials, and articles about the climate crisis and carbon pricing. And they've been doing that since 2010. And in 2018, Senator Grant Mitchell said, you're one of the most successful lobbying groups I've worked with because you're about to get what you lobbied for. And then they claim democracy requires healthy engagement between citizens and politicians. Well, uh, call me naive, but 
I, I'd, I'd like to ask viewers, have you had an opportunity to make 1,400, 14,000 um, interactions? 1,400. 1,400 interactions with parliamentarians. Have you been able to write thousands of op-eds and uh, editorials and get them published? You know, that represent your views on carbon pricing and the, cli the alleged climate crisis? I would say most people are actually too busy working to do that. So um, I guess a question I would have, and if I were CBC, I would be asking who's funding this organization and their incessant lobbying efforts. Um, don't you think that that's a reasonable question to ask? But let's go on and have a look at some of the other things here. So. You know, one of the things that the climate activist groups are pushing for is a personal carbon ration. Maybe you remember that Greta Thunberg and George Monbiot made this short film on the climate crisis. This comes from The Guardian, I believe. And this is something that George Monbiot has been dreaming about for a long time, since 2009. He wanted to use the target to set an annual carbon cap which falls on the ski jump traje trajectory, use the cap to set a personal carbon ration. Every citizen is given a free annual quota of carbon dioxide. He spends it by buying gas and electricity, petrol and train and plane tickets, and if he runs out, he must buy the rest from someone who has used less than their quota. Well, 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 how would you feel about that, a personal carbon ration? And in terms of uh, carbon trading, we must remember that this little visit between Greta Thunberg and the Prime Minister only cost us $6 billion. That's what two billion trees and a promise to a foreign activist are costing you. Now, people say, oh, planting trees is a great thing. Well, Holly Doan here in, of Black Locks Reporter is saying it's a law in Canada and has been for many years. If you cut a tree, you must plant a tree. So logging companies over 10 years would plant 6 billion trees. So trees are no problem. And of course, in Alberta, the forestry industry plants three trees for everyone harvested. But trees are an essential part of carbon trading and carbon trading is lucrative. Interpol sees it fraught with fraud and you can read their report on uh, we have it posted on our climate change 101 site and this basically explains how the carbon market works it's a cap and trade regime a limit or cap is set for countries or companies on the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions they can emit if they exceed the limit they're required to buy carbon credits from others and those with spare carbon credits may sell the surplus to emitters that require more, the trade. So here's an example from the Guide to Carbon Trading Crime that a power plant in Germany expands. It needs four additional credits to cover its emissions. So it buys two credits from this Indonesian tree planting project. And it buys two from this industrial firm that has four credits given by the government and uh, so it just uh, sells two of its spare credits. But curiously, other foreign funded ENGOs are presently pushing for cap and trade on oil and gas. So a strong cap means cap and trade will be a must. So there seems to be some kind of coordination going on honestly. Cap and trade clearly described, and this is a tweet. I think it's the best one I've ever read about <laughs> cap and trade. Cap and trade is dumb. Imagine paying people who don't rob banks so that people who do can continue their practice. That's what it is in principle. USA pays a price so that China can pollute. Dumb from the get-go, meant to enrich middlemen like Gore. Well, couldn't have said it better myself. And in False Alarm by Bjorn Lomborg, he recounts how the EU governments gave free emissions credits to industry who then charged citizens as if they had had to pay for them. 
to the tune of $80 billion U.S. So since 2005, green billionaires have been pushing global cap and trade using environmental groups as proxies. So this is a very good paper to read by Matthew Nisbet. He's been tracking these green billionaires for a couple of decades now, I believe. Strategic philanthropy in the post cap and trade years, because cap and trade failed uh, under the Obama administration. But look at this. The Biden taps former Clinton aide John Podesta to serve as senior White House advisor for clean energy. Well, 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 he's sitting on a pot full of money. And of course, he used to be the chair of the Climate Works Foundation, which is mentioned in here and which has been pumping out millions of dollars every year to environmental groups. And those environmental groups in turn have been agitating for policy change, just like Citizens Climate Lobby has done. Now, I don't have evidence that they've actually funded Citizens Climate Lobby, but I have evidence that they funded tons of other very well-known ENGOs, especially in Canada. So this originated with this plan designed to win, which Nisbet talks about in his paper, and they drew upon the skills of McKinsey and Company which is one of the largest management firms in the world and uh, they reportedly received uh, $42.4 million for their consulting fees on this program to the Climate Works Foundation. And uh, the Climate Works Foundation even set up this kind of global uh, network of groups that would push for different types of uh, cap and trade uh, programs in their region. So, I mean, uh, you know, people like to say, oh, um, uh, you know, people often say, oh, don't be a conspiracy theorist. Well, you know, conspiracies don't have to be hidden. They can be right out in the open and they can be at a level uh, that is so beyond the ordinary citizen. And um, in terms that the ordinary citizen, you know, never thinks about, that it can be that there is a conspiracy right out in the open. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that this is illegal either. I think from what I've seen, everything they've done is perfectly legal. It's just that it circumvents the actual democratic process. Um, because you or I didn't have a say in these ENGOs that they funded to push their agenda. We didn't really have a say because we didn't know what was happening. I mean, not until some of the Tar Sands campaign was unveiled by uh, Vivian Krause and uh, Ezra Levant, and uh, then later the Alberta Inquiry and also some of the work that we've done. So these revelations happened long after the fact um, and long after many of the policies and laws and regulations were passed thanks to the push by these environmental groups just as we've seen with the citizens climate lobby pushing the um, carbon fee and dividend program which most Canadians are now part of whether they like it or not So um, let's press on here and see what else we have. So EcoJustice says on their website that their services are offered for free. Um, but we know that somebody pays for them. And uh, oftentimes they use these kind of events as a way to raise funds. You know, they're always pushing donate, you know, if you want to help our kids in their court case against the Ontario government. You can donate, so it's a good fundraiser for them. This is from the Financial Post, and this is a piece that Vivian Krauss uncovered, that when um, when uh, EcoJustice went to the Federal Court of Appeal, um, they seeking to stall Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pipeline project, what wasn't publicly known at the time is that the application had been funded, at least partially, as part of the Tar Sands campaign. And for people overseas, the Tar Sands campaign 
is a green trade war against the Alberta oil sands that's been going on for at least 20 years. Most of it is foreign funded. Um, we now know this because the Living Ocean Society is one of the applicants to the Federal Court of Appeal and they reported to the Internal Revenue Service in the U.S. that it spent $63,547 on this litigation and the origin of the money is not publicly reported but Living Ocean spent that amount in 2016 on litigation to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline that's a pipeline being built in Canada from Alberta to the British Columbia coast by intervening in its regulatory review and bringing judicial review proceedings. And they say in their IRS filings that the society worked with nonprofit lawyers at EcoJustice to intervene in the regulatory review of the Kinder Morton Trans Mountain Pipeline and Tanker Project, Living Oceans reported to the IRS. So they may offer their services at EcoJustice to their clients for free, but someone pays. And ironically, if we think back to February, fear of foreign funding and interference in Canadian policies froze the Freedom Convoy bank accounts. So there was this influential commentary by Mark Carney, who wrote, it's time to end the sedition in Ottawa by enforcing the law and following the money. And in that article, he intimated that the Freedom Convoy was funded by foreign sources. And it turned out that uh, Barry McKillop of uh, FinTrack, which is a digital fun, uh, financial tracking service within Canada, he testified uh, to the inquiry that, uh, in fact, most of the money had come from Canadians very little had come from Americans and most of the money was in small denominations in the order of a hundred dollars, twenties, fifties, five hundred. So uh, if we look at what's gone on in Canada we find that, and this is slightly out of date now, this is uh, dealing with the period from 2000 to 2018, but we find that during that time EcoJustice got millions of dollars from foreign funders. And this is in our report, Big Green Money versus Conventional Energy Advocates. So it's funny, I think, that CBC really has no questions. They are just repeaters and not reporters. So, you know, you pay through tax subsidized charitable status of eco-justice. There's a loss of funds to the tax pool. You pay through the costs of court action. And then you pay for the underwriting of CBC, which is in the order of a billion plus, which asks no relevant questions about funding or possible conflicts of interest. So maybe it's time to ask the Canada Revenue Agency, how is this court case of eco-justice and the seven Gen Climate Action Kids a charitable activity? What is the net benefit to Canadians, and this is an excerpt from the um, CRA's policy on charitable activity. Unfortunately, it's becoming clearer all the time that the big green Titanic is going to sink Canada, and I offer you our four reports. We are going to post this um, video and the, and the PowerPoint on our blog so that you can go through and check out the links. But you can see that billions and billions of dollars have flowed into Canada um, and billions of dollars have become the revenues. Also, you know, some of this did come from Canadian sources, but these are the revenues of like the top 40 environmental groups. This is a staggering amount of money and it's definitely influencing Canadian policies. So if you'd like, you can have a look at our youth-oriented website. It's bilingual. You can choose French or English here. It's called climatechange101.ca. And there's a number of topics there that you can go through and have a look at. Um, we tried to sort of simplify some of the things so it's easier for people to grasp. But certainly, 
the 97% consensus that people talk about and that is included in the eco-justice uh, court documents is simply nonsenses. There's no 97% consensus on a climate catastrophe. Not at all. So this is a bit about us. Um, we're an independent group of Earth, atmospheric, and solar scientists, engineers, and citizens. We're celebrating our 20th year of offering climate science insights. And we've concluded that the sun is the main driver of climate change, not carbon dioxide. I'd like you to stay tuned for part two, debunking eco-justice climate kids court case. And in part two, we'll deal with the climate claims. Um, but in the meantime, we'd like to ask that if you like our work and you want to support us, we are in our 20th year of operation and we've asked people to simply offer say a $20 donation. You can send us an e-transfer um, to contact at friendsofscience.org or you can go on to our main site and there's a spot there in the upper corner where you can uh, donate or join us, become a member and then you'll get our newsletters that cover climate and climate politics in the world, things that are never reported in the mainstream media. So thanks very much for watching and tune in for part two and you'll see just how crazy the reporting is by CBC and how distorted the climate information is that we're stuffing down kids' throats. So thanks for watching and um, for Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.